Hello folks. Well, let's see. Last time around we took a look at Bash's use of globbing and wild cards to match patterns from the command line. We can take a more extensive version that matches patterns against strings when we're inside a script or inside a function and we're trying to process strings. Uh, this is going to be particularly useful when we're looking at things like the arguments that are passed to a script or passed to a function where we want to see if what got passed matches the pattern, the kind of text that we were expecting to receive. So this idea of pattern matching is going to bring us to the notion of regular expressions, which is a means of, uh, of describing different patterns. So we'll play with some of the common regular expression syntax ideas for Bash. You're going to see similar ideas in lots of other languages over the course of time, but this is a good place to get going on them. So Bash has an operator that lets us compare the contents of a string to a pattern and say, yes or no, does this string match this pattern? So the operator is the equal tilde. And so we're going to use that inside double square brackets, as we'll see in just a moment, to compare strings to patterns. And again, we're going to see this an awful lot when we're checking parameters to see if they match what we're expecting, see if the format for them is valid. Now, when it comes to expressing our patterns, they're going to have lots of special characters in them. So generally speaking, you're going to want to put them in single quotes but we'll see that as we plow our way along here. So the most basic idea is just a pattern where we say, I want to see if this string contains a particular sequence of characters. So if I want to see if a string contains the word blah anywhere in it, then I can just use blah as my pattern. And I can use the equal tilde to say, okay, for this string, does it contain blah? So again, we're going to use the double square brackets syntax for the comparison. In this case, I've got a function, um, although that should be a lowercase f over there. I've got a function contains blah. And so it's expecting to get a parameter. Uh, it should probably check to make sure it did receive a parameter, but uh, we'll set a local variable parameter to whatever the first parameter passed was. We'll set our pattern to the string blah in just single quotes. And then we'll use this if the parameter matches the pattern, then we'll just spit out a little sentence that says the parameter contains the pattern. All right, so we've got our string variable and our pattern variable, and we're using that equal tilde to compare them. And again, it's true if the string, if the argument contains the word blah, false otherwise. And we will play with a lot of examples of this in a few minutes. So we'll see a lot of syntax that was similar to the globbing that we looked at earlier. Um, it's not quite the same, so you do have to keep in the back of your mind that globbing is distinct from the expression matching we're doing here. So you can use, again, the syntax um, square brackets and then a bunch of letters to say this, this matches any one of those characters. And again, you can specify ranges. So if you say a dot dot z, that's going to match anything in the range a to z, lowercase. And again, you can use the caret to say, okay, anything except these characters. So the square bracket, the uh, caret, and a 1 dot dot 9 is going to match anything except the digits 1 to 9. So again, that's pretty similar to what we saw in the globbing. You can go through and specify that a pattern can repeat a certain number of times. So if you want to say that um, a particular string can have the word blah in it one to ten times in a row, we can express that, or zero or more times, or at least once, or etc. etc. So the different options that are available to us are to specify the pattern, and I'm going to throw it in the round brackets just to keep things clear for Bash what I want repeated. So I've got some pattern in round brackets, and then I throw the asterisk afterwards, and that means zero or more times. So it means the string is valid if it doesn't have that pattern in it at all, or if it's got the pattern in it once, or twice in a row, or three times in a row, or uh, you know 5,000 times in a row. 
the question mark means zero or one. So the pattern can either not be there or it can be there exactly once. You can specify a range of times like one to five or you know 60 to 500. Or you can use the plus to specify at least once, but one or more times. So again, we can specify that a pattern can repeat. There are times when we want to be able to say that a certain pattern has to be at the beginning of a string or the end of a string. Right before, everything we've done is just basically saying, does the string contain some pattern? If we throw the caret in, so this is different than when the caret appears inside the square brackets. So if we have the caret and then some pattern, it's saying that pattern has to match the beginning of the string. So at the start of the string, you have to see this pattern. Or if you use the dollar sign at the end, you're saying, okay, the string has to end with this pattern, right? So the pattern appears and then the end of the string. And again, if you don't include those, then it's assumed that there can be anything before or after the, part, the pattern that you're looking for. Hey, we'll play with all this in uh, some examples in a few minutes. You can say that you want something, you want to see if the string matches either pattern one or pattern two, X or Y, whatever it might be, just with the single vertical bar. So you're saying, okay, I want something that matches either the first pattern or the second pattern. So the best way to go here is to start playing with some examples. If you wanted to specify, I want to see if a particular string would be a good match for a positive integer. So we're going to say that it can't, it's not allowed to have leading zeros and it's got to be nothing but digits. All right, so usually the first trick is to sit down and think about, okay, well, how would I describe the pattern that I'm looking for? So maybe I decide that a positive integer can't begin with a zero and all it's got in it are digits. So the first character would be something in the range one to nine, and then there might be any number of additional characters, but each of them would have to be something in the range zero to nine. There can't be extra garbage before or after it, or it's not a valid integer. So we wanna make sure that we include the caret and the dollar around the ends. So our pattern is gonna look something like this. Again, this is gonna be in single quotes, and we'll specify it's got the caret, mark the beginning of the string and then in square brackets the one dot dot nine to indicate that the first character has to be a single digit in the range one to nine and then the zero to nine and an asterisk to indicate that there can be any number of additional digits and then the dollar sign indicating that that's where the the pattern has to end so as far as we're concerned if a string matches that pattern, then we're saying, okay, that's a valid positive integer for what we're trying to represent. So you can come up with an expression to match the pattern that you're interested in and test strings to see if they match that. Uh, if we want to go for a fancier example, so let's say we want to match and see if a string matches the pattern for a time in a 24-hour format. So it's got to have two digits to represent the hour, and then a semicolon, and then two digits to represent the minutes. And it's going to be in a 24-hour format, so it can be any, anything in the range 0000 to 2359, for instance. Now, we have to think about what would be valid combinations for the hour and what would be valid combinations for the minutes. Right. For the hour, that first character could be a 0, a 1, or a 2. If it's a 0 or a 1, the second character could be anything um, 0 to 9. But if it's a 2, then that second character could only be a 0, 1, 2, or a 3. So we're going to have a slightly more complex pattern for the hours part, right, where we're going to have to say, okay, well, if, if it's, it can either start with a 0, 0, followed by a 0 to 9, or pardon me, it can start with a 0 or 1 followed by a 0 to 9, or it can start with a 2 followed by a 0 to 4. So we'll take a look at that part first, and then we'll take a look at the minutes. 
So it winds up looking kind of ugly, but if we break it down piece by piece, we're saying at the beginning of the string, we can have either a zero or a one followed by something in the range zero to three, or we can have a two followed by something in the range zero to nine. Right, so that's the first half of our pattern where we're specifying the hours. And then we've got to have the colon next. And then for the minutes, well, what can the minutes be? The, uh, the first digit has got to be in the range 0 to 5, and the second in the range 0 to 9. So that's actually not too bad. We'll have a single digit in the range 0 to 5, and then a single digit in the range 0 to 9, and then the string has to end. Right? So you can gradually build up the pattern that you want. And we're saying, as far as we're concerned, any string that matches this pattern is a valid representation of a time. So this is the style of thing that we're going to be looking at with our regular expressions. And again, regular expressions are going to come back time and time again because they're a really common way of trying to describe strings that we're interested in. So let's see if we can have a play with a couple of examples here. Uh, let's see, so let's take a look at a quick script here to just play with a few patterns and then we'll try seeing what matches. So I'm going to come up with uh, descriptions of a few different kinds of patterns. So the first one is a slightly simpler description of an integer pattern than the one we used a moment ago. So this time I'm going to say that if it's a string that consists entirely of digits 0 to 9, then it's a valid integer pattern. So this can have a whole bunch of zeros at the beginning. So at the beginning, or, or we'll have the beginning of our string, any number of zero to nines, and then the end. Uh, second pattern we'll take a look at is to say, okay, let's have um, a vowel in the third spot. So there are going to be two characters at the front, we don't care what, then a vowel, and then anything after that. So we're saying at the front of the string, we've got any two characters. So you can use the dot to represent any character. And then in our curly brackets, the two that to indicate that there are going to be two of them. So any two characters, and then any one of A, E, I, O, or U. And then we don't care what's after that. So we don't need the dollar on the end. All right, so we can see if there's a vowel in the third position. or if I want to specify um, a .cpp file, right? one of the ways I could do it is to say, well, it's got to end in dot and cpp. Right? So then we've got the dollar sign for to mark the ending of the pattern. But we don't need the caret or anything before that, because we're basically saying, well, it can start with anything at all, just as long as it ends in dot cpp. Or if we want to go through and describe any string that has some characters in it, but none of them are digits, right? we could go through and say, well, we'll include the caret and the dollar because we're saying this has to match the whole string. Right? The string can't have some extra digits on one side or the other. It's got one or more characters inside it, and those characters can be anything that isn't a digit. And so we can go through and describe all sorts of different patterns. And it's just a matter of coming up with the right regular expression. So then what we're going to do is go through and we'll just try a little collection of if else's where we'll get the user to enter some text. And we'll just see which of these patterns it matches. So we prompt them, you know, enter some text, they type in whatever. We store it in our string variable. And then we'll compare it to the four patterns, and we'll just accept the first one that it matches. So again, we're in the double square brackets. We're using the equal tilde to say, does this string match this pattern? If it does, then we'll say it matches the integer pattern. Um, if it doesn't match the integer, we'll test it against the, the ends in .cpp. If it doesn't match that, we'll check it and see if it matches the one that's got a vowel in the third position. If it doesn't match that, we'll see if it's got no digits. Right, so we'll just see which is the first one of these four combinations that it matches, or we'll say it doesn't match any of those. Now, 
these aren't mutually exclusive. Right? Something that contains no digits could end in .cpp. Um, either one of them could contain a vowel in the third position, etc. So these things overlap, but uh, we're just going to pick the first first pattern that matches whatever string the user enters. So if we were to try this out, then hopefully uh, we'll run regex.sh and I don't know, we'll try the integers first. We'll give it a bunch of, of digits. Oops. <laughs> Sorry, it's not looking for command line arguments. It wants me to type them in. So we'll give it a bunch of digits. And it matches the int pattern. Great. Um, if we try uh, foo.cpp, hopefully it matches the .cpp pattern. If we just try foo, then hopefully it matches the vowel in the third pat in the third position. If we come up with something that doesn't match any of those, oops, then it matches the no digits. All right, so again, you can go through and come up with things that um, that fit the different patterns, or see if we can get one that uh, doesn't match any of these. So we don't want it to be uh, all digits, but we don't want it to be no digits. So we want a mix of these things that doesn't end in .cpp and doesn't have a vowel in the third position. There we go. It doesn't match any pattern. So again, we can start playing with regular expressions. And the way we'll use this the most is to test if the arguments that were passed or if user input matches what we think they should be providing us with. All right, we will leave that there for now.